Ingvar var inte narkoman. Det säger dessvärre alla föräldrar. Vad tänker ni göra? Jag tror det var inte meningen att det skulle vara... Och Ingvar hade med... Så det är helt sant att han visste ingenting. Och nu ska jag ta med sig. Vad är det för fall? Bra hem till vidare. Okej? Jeg trodde vi var enige om det, at vi ikke trengte å snakke om jobb når vi var på vei til skolen og hadde det kjekt. Har du husket frukten? Nå blir det ikke noe frukt i dag, og jeg beklager det. Det er noen som utgitter folk om mine. Det er noen som utgitter territoriene mine. Når en far måtte kunne hemne sin sånn. Finner vi faen ikke i det. Er du ikke klar over hvem du er på bakke om her? Du er så ferdig da. Hvis norske barn bare forsvinner, så er det alltid noen jævla slitsomme foreldre, sånn. Så skal jeg lete etter det. Oh my god. Det er det nå. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Guys, have a seat. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for making this kick-ass movie. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, take me back to the beginning. You guys have worked together. This is what, your fourth, fifth time uh, working together? Yeah, the fourth time. Fourth time. What made you want to make a, a crime film of, uh, of this ilk? Uh, I wanted to explore what happens to a man who thinks of himself as a civilized human being when he's devastated by the loss of his son in this way and uh, uh, try to test the sort of limits of his uh, civility. Did you find that when you started from there, you ended up sort of building this other sort of criminal world that was a bit uh, darkly funny? Did you expect to go into that territory? It's it's hard to say where things, but it, obviously it evolves. But also, I think it. <coughs> sorry. Um, I I uh, I, I kind of like uh, taking a piss out of things that take itself too seriously. And I think very often, uh, uh, you know, crime genre is populated with super intelligent and bright uh, criminals. You know, most of them are really stupid, and this film is proof of it. And that's kind of where I think some of the uh, nods to the Coen brothers come from a little bit. A lot of times in the Coen brothers films that are sort of the, the, criminal, the criminal world in those movies, the criminals are fairly stupid in figuring it out as they, as they go along, as they are in this movie. Yeah, and you know, it's... Um, thanks for the, you know, making that association. I'm a great fan of the Coen brothers. <laughs> but uh, I, I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of humor to this film, but... Uh, it's oblivious to the characters in it. You know, yeah. they're dead serious or dead. Selen, I would say the uh, the humor's uh, it's uh, it's oblivious to your character a lot, who's clearly in a revenge path in in the film. I don't think we've ever seen you get the chance to play a kind of action star before. Was this new for you? Well, I did a couple of sort of secret agent action films in Sweden, but they didn't travel well. This one will. Yeah, this I think it will. No, well, I'm I'm all over the the map. I'm I'm trying to do uh, to entertain myself by doing different things all the time. So. And what did you find uh, entertaining about this uh, when you initially signed on for it? Well, I actually said no to it to begin with because I I couldn't see the film in the script. It, it's so many different tones and and genres and everything, and I I couldn't understand what kind of film it would turn into. And but Hans Peter convinced me by saying, "Trust me." <laughs> how, did, how do you say trust me in a way that gets someone to sign on to shoot with you for a couple months? Uh, well, you know, we're good friends, so, uh, you know, he would keep balking, he would, you know, throw all these uh, difficult questions at me, and I would try to come back with some good examples of why this would be, uh, you know, humorous and out of the ordinary. And I think one of the arguments I made to him was that when his character is about to commit suicide and his lip gets frozen to the and sticks to the yeah. barrel of the gun if you could get people both to feel sorry for him 
about being so devastated, but in the next, next moment starting to laugh, then that would kind of bridge the ambition of that film. And that's kind of the cue of the tonal change in the, in the movie, right? At that point, it's like we've sort of had a somewhat tr devastating tragedy happen to this character, and this most minor slip up in the midst of an attempted suicide is the moment where you think, oh, maybe I can actually laugh with this movie a little bit. Yeah, I think that's you know, well said. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very subtle tonal change. Were you ever worried when you were going into it that you might not be able to pull it off? And were you worried, Son? I mean, clearly you said no initially for a reason that you might be worried that the tonal change would be hard to pull off. How did the two of you sort of become uh, confident in, in, in this working? I wasn't <laughs> confident at all until I saw it. Uh, I said I was just hoping that he would pull it off, and uh, and uh, then I saw the first cut, and then oh yeah, he he knows he knows what he's doing. But we've done four films together. Uh, there's a lot of trust involved. But it was one of the ambitions of this film was was actually to disregard a lot of the conventions of genre, and also I felt not being limited by being just within one genre. So making those sort of effortless transitions from one genre, to, you know, from different, also different types of comedy, you know, high comedy or slapstick or... You say effortless, it's like, it's effortless for me, the viewer, but I can't imagine it's effortless for you, the filmmaker. No, and it's, uh, but it's part of the fun and in, in, in trying to make that happen. But I think, you know, modern audiences are so subjected to so much uh, and they are sophisticated enough to once they get that clue that you pointed to i think they uh, they want to go along and say okay now i can expect just about anything within this film and then being surprised uh, and um, and uh, taken in unexpected directions is part of the fun of going to the movies. Yeah. And as the film progresses without giving too much away, you have a, a crime boss who's de dealing with marital issues and sort of a kind of a custody battle almost. You have a, a couple of other gangsters who are sort of in the midst of a sort of secret relationship with each other. There's all these different uh, elements of these ga gangsters' personalities that are brought to life that somehow, that don't really have that much of a sort of tangible effect to the plot sometimes. Can you talk about developing that and sort of having that add life to this sort of uh, bare skeleton crime story? Yeah, well, you know, instead of just having the characters become functions to actually have them uh, uh, being human beings with some, you know, motives or life of their own which colors or affects the 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 plot because I think plot in itself is usually boring and it's overrated it's a it's a device but uh, we usually go to the movies to be in the company of interesting people you know yeah absolutely Stellan I think uh, one of the things for a movie like this as much as the tone of the mo the movie is changing and the filmmaker is doing that you as the actor how responsible do you feel for making those tonal changes as well or do you try to you know, play it straight the whole time because your character doesn't know that the tone is changing. Yeah, well, um, my job is, it's such a crazy movie, so my job is to keep, to keep it sane in a way by being the, the, the emotional center of the movie, the, the foundation. Um, so, so if I had to make my character believable and I had to be the, the way into the story for the audience and, and I was surrounded by all those absolutely crazy people. The first scene I had with, with, uh, with the guy who plays the Norwegian gangster boss, uh, I, w I, I came to the set and I played my scene and I underplayed as I usually do. And I meet this guy who's playing so over the top. It's like he was trying to, I mean, like he was on a big stage, like on Wembley Stadium or something, you know? And I was going, wow, are we in the same movie? And I looked at Hans Petter, and he, he just nodded. <laughs> and I, trust me, trust me, trust me. And I, how the fuck am I going to trust him? Uh, um, it was absolutely insane. And I, I could not believe that two so different ways of acting could be in the same scene, and the scene would still work. But somehow, then, when I saw the film, you buy it. But, but uh, my challenge was, of course, I, I mean, I have very little comedy myself. Actually, you could say that. The comedy is things like my lip get fr freezes to the gun barrel when I'm trying to kill myself. 
But I, of course, I play it as if I'm trying to kill myself, because otherwise there will be no collision between the comedy and the tragedy of the situation. But your character has moments where he has uh, levity. He has brief moments of laughter, sort of in the midst of when he realizes that he's pretty good at killing people. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's not sullen all the time. <laughs> he eventually, he, he starts, to, I think he starts to enjoy it, bringing out the caveman in him. But you know, the, I mean, most of the characters in this film are oblivious to the humor that they are providing, you know, and uh, and the count, like you know, he's he's a very uh, expressive character, but to him, he's not over the top. He's a perfectly sane human being within uh, his existence. Or he's as over to over the top as he needs to be to be the boss. He needs to show everybody consistently that but he's he, the one in charge. But he he is he thinks he is a very rational character, which of course we know he isn't. You know. And he's a vegan. He, he might be the first crime boss in a movie to be, to be a vegan, right? Yeah, yeah, and he even drives an electric car because that's you know, environmentally friendly. Was that the intention, to have the first, the first sort of envir environmentally conscious crime boss to, to be in a movie? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they exist, but uh, this is the first time it's brought to the screen. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it does exist. Uh, so you have uh, you have a number of kids yourself. You have f four, four or five children. Eight. Eight children. Excuse me. Um, well, it's a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you step into a movie like this, and obviously it's a revenge fantasy crime thriller, and it can be all fantasy, but it is about the loss of a child and the sort of the the feelings that sort of would stem from that. Do you use any of that? Do you think about your your family at all, or is it sort of such a fantastical world that you've created that you don't really have to go there? Um, I never think of my family, really. When you but, work? Uh, no, well, I do, actually. But, but, it, but it's, it's uh, of course, it's very easy for a father to imagine what it would be like losing a son. It's, then it's not a, but it's not a big secret. You actually don't have to have, to have children to understand that. Uh, but, of course, I, I know that I'm a very peaceful person, and I'm against against killing people in general and capital punishment and lynchings and everything. But I can understand the feeling that you want to see blood when something is done to your children. Uh, so I could absolutely associate with that, even if I don't morally agree with his actions. Does the same, would you say the same comes from uh, movie violence? And this is in no way a question posed under the guise of like, should we have movie violence or not? I, Personally, I love movie violence. I think it's really fun. But I'm also very anti-capital punishment. I'm mu very much a pacifist. But I get a giddy pleasure out of watching blood spray out of the back of someone's head in a crime movie. Would you, where, where would you say that that comes from? Not personally, but in general. Uh, I'm not your psychoanalyst. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Guys, look, I just want to talk. You, know? <laughs> you just want to talk. If you lie down there, I'll talk, <laughs> talk a little and I'll tell you. Yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we've always been fascinated because, I mean, we, we are aware of our own, uh, the, the, the imminence of our own deaths. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's like, so it's fun to see someone else die because at least it's not me. Uh, the, I mean, it's, if you look at the, what happened at the, uh, the gladiators at Colosseum, people flocked to see people die. And now you can do it with CGI so you don't have to kill people for real. Which is good. You don't have to get dirty. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's still. I mean, the, the, there's a morbid side to all of this. Hans Petter, uh, when you're making a movie like this and you have gruesome crime scenes and and gruesome murders, do you ever worry that you're going too dark? Do you ever worry that people are going to get the humor of uh, even these deaths? Because one of the things that's great about the films is that the deaths themselves are, you know, as brutal as they as they would be in life, to a degree. Yeah, I mean. I think by uh, making it uh, with that much humor, it allows you to be uh, both be brutal and to to tell. I mean, it's a cautionary tale about revenge. It's a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, but it allows you to be more playful and to go places with the material that you otherwise wouldn't be allowed to because it is stylized. It is. Um, uh, although it's brutal and it's grotesque, it, it plays more to a morbid fascination than to 
trying to get people to go, eh, you know. Um, so I, I think uh, for an audience, it, uh, it relieves them of having to stay within such a really terrible story uh, without some kind of levity or lightness to it. Would you ever make a sequel to this movie? Because it does feel like you've set up this character to realize he's pretty good at violence and can be thrust into situations afterwards. I tried actually to make it uh, back to back. Uh, I, I wrote a skeleton uh, script of uh, what happens to the two, uh, Bruno Ganz's character and Stellan's character uh, when they drive off in the mountains together. Uh, but they didn't want to finance it, but... Um, Can I ask personally, like, a little bit of what happens to the two of them when they drive off into the mountains together? <laughs> well, in the beginning, there's some really awkward silences because <laughs> they've been trying to kill each other. <laughs> it's a little bit like Netanyahu and uh, Abbas meeting and uh, <laughs> having to go on a cruise together, you know. <laughs> but eventually... Who's, you, uh, who, who's, who's Bibi in that situation? <laughs> Gans? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and then, the, <laughs> then they have to start talking, you know, and it's like, uh, would you mind passing the butter, you know, and eventually you get a conversation going, you know, and uh, I think it's much harder to be hostile to people that you actually go on a road trip with, you know, eventually you you stop for a pee or you ask for a cup of coffee and uh, and next thing you know, you're having dinner together, you know. So you went from, from this film to just sort of like a light road comedy. <laughs> Yeah, or, you know, at least that, you know, uh, while they're in the wilderness, they're sort of like uh, nobody's watching them. When they get to the other side, they have to make choices, you know. Shall we kill each other or shall we go our separate ways? Or uh, it, uh, it should be made, I think. So you've, uh, you've made a lot of movies over the course of your career, a number of them classics at, at this point. What do you look towards, or what do you look for in a script when it when it comes to setting up to shoot? Is it the people that you're going to be working with, or is it the the work itself? Yeah, I want to have fun, uh, which means uh, it's the people I'm. It's very much about the people I'm going to work with, and uh, and then it depends on what I just did. I want to. I want to. If I've done a very dark, uh, independent film under very harsh conditions, then it's very nice to go and do a. A Hollywood blockbuster movie. You mean a Lars von Trier film? Uh, <laughs> no, but that is actually easy. It's very yeah, yeah easy. Uh, Lars von Trier, that's peanuts. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're the. He was only referring to working with me, <laughs> compared to working with him, because Lars von Trier is always comfortable in good food, but he he shoots in the wilderness uh, where it's <laughs> like minus thirty degrees and uh, horrible. Our first film we shot in in Spitsberg, uh, close to the North Pole. That's where, that's where it drags me, and I'm a city boy. I like to I like like concrete and pavement and warmth. <laughs> and he he drags me out. The only time I get in fresh air is when I work with him. Um, what was your question again? <laughs> uh, what leads you to make the decisions that? Uh, well, it is it is the people. It's it's very much about the people, but 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 it 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 varies. But it's also what I, I what I really like doing is doing films that I haven't seen before. Uh, there's so much material out there that is just um, trying to copy another film that was successful, and that's pretty boring. But this film, for instance, I haven't seen before. Uh, I've barely seen it now, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but it's 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 fun. And uh, and with with, with Lars von Trier, I worked with six eight times or something, and with Hans Petter four times. So it's good when you when you have good friends uh, where you don't have to talk so much when you work. I have to ask, uh, Lars von Trier, uh, probably you know one of my favorite filmmakers. Breaking the Waves, I think, is just like a, one of the most beautiful films ever made. But I'm also curious about working with Lars von Trier and in regards to provocation. Like, how often do you guys know or think about how much provocation you're tying up, tying into the philosophical point that von Trier might be making, and how much one might override the other? Well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel. I'm not provocated by his films, so so if, to me it's normality in a way. Uh, but but working with him is of course he he he's, he's like a very talented child, uh, and if you look at the dialogue in his films, it's like nursery rhyme level on it, which makes it very weird and horrible in a way. Is that difficult to play? It's it's not, but he, he, sometimes he says, "Can't you improvise something?" And I say, "No." 
<laughs> I cannot improvise your childish tone. That is impossible. So, 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 uh, so I never improvise in his films. Um, but, it's, but working with him is, is so easy. He doesn't say anything. He says, yeah, let's start. And then he rolls the camera, and he doesn't even tell you where to stand or anything. And then everybody goes and acts a little here, acts a little there. And, and then can we do a version where everybody's laughing? Yeah, and then we do that version. And, and then he collects material. Uh, so it's very easy, but it's it's the uh, you have with Hans Petter. I feel I have the same kind of freedom, even if uh, the way of shooting is different. But I feel that I'm safe. I can do mistakes. I can try things, and that makes you brave and bold. What's it been like to work with uh, Lars and Hans Petter for you know the number of films that you guys have done, and sort of seen the way that the way they've worked has changed? How has the way that they've gone about making the films changed for you as an actor? Sort of go on expecting the same experience, but maybe they've changed as an artist. Well, um, when it comes to Lars, he, I was in the first film when, he, uh, his first five films were extremely controlled. All directors are control freaks and uh, have some weirdness from their childhood, but, but, uh, <laughs> including you. Uh, but but, uh, but, but he, 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 tr he controlled everything in his films, and they were technically brilliant, but dead. Because if you try to control life, then you're in trouble. Life has to be irrational. You have to leave some space for your irrationality. And I did Break in the Waves was the first feature film he did without controlling everything, where he just let go. And he had big signs on the set that said, make mistakes. And we did make mistakes. We made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but, but, but then he, he reduced, uh, he took away more and more of his tools until the Dogville, uh, 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 where, where he had, it was just the text, the actors, and a camera, and total freedom in front of the camera. And then now I've realized that suddenly, that when we did Nymphomaniac, I saw a tripod on the set. Well, so he's bringing back his tools again, and there was even one tracking shot. And, and I, I, I accused him of being a bourgeois prick, of course. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to the changes of, uh, of Hans Petter, it's, it's our first films, two films, were extremely big, heavy dramas. And uh, our two last films, uh, or latest films, have been uh, our attempts to be funny, uh, kind of comedies, but with a weird touch. Um, oh. and, and that, that is sort of... Uh, and, but what I would say is that gradually Hans Petter has gone f f more and more to reduce text uh, that is sort of dead meat. And uh, if it is any text, it's a lot of text and it means something. But, uh, but otherwise he, he expresses himself much, much more with just shooting, uh, telling the story without um, having the, the characters explaining it. Hans Petter, are these uh, things that you've noticed about yourself as a filmmaker as well, that, uh, sort of traits that you've grown into or grown away from? Well, the, I, the comedy aspect of it uh, I, I certainly recognize. And, you know, I've, I've made a lot of comedy in commercials, actually. I've made a good, you know, um, a lot of practice. But, you know, it's, it's been daunting to, to think of making a comedy. So actually when we made... A somewhat gentle man. We refused to call it a comedy until we actually had shown it and saw that somebody laughed, you know, that, uh, uh, which was in Covering Berlin. all your bases there. <laughs> so we were in Berlin and, uh, you know, 1,800 people there in, uh, in the big uh, theater. And when people laughed, we said, yeah, it is a comedy, you know. But, uh, um, but making comedies is very, is very hard, you know. Uh, would you say it's harder than drama? I think some people, uh, I mean, I would say... I would just I would say that comedy is harder than drama just simply because of the the beats that you have to hit and making people laugh is seems harder to me than yeah I wouldn't say that it's easier or harder but it's it's certainly something that requires discipline and precision in a way that you perhaps in a, to a certain extent can get away with the uh, in in dramas you know it's more unforgiving in a way um, and of course if people don't laugh that's very unforgiving. It's. Uh, uh, I think Stalin is right. I'm. I get bored with the uh, with anything that uh, has been done before. So text that's getting the plot from A to B or anything like that. I try to avoid and just try to tell it in a different way. 
Um, but I, I think the the privilege, you know, when when we've done four films together and we have a lot of fun working together, um, and I feel you know it's it's a very generous and uh, and healthy environment when when he's around. But you know, he's usually done maybe five ten films since the last time we worked together. So he comes with sort of impulses from the outside world, you know. I've been just sitting at home waiting for him to finish up all this other stuff, you know. And <laughs> so he, he uh, perhaps has uh, gone through a lot more of a transition than I have, you know. Or at least, uh, you know, he's been out playing with big time directors and, uh, you know, seen a lot of, lot of the world without me. That's so interesting. I, I feel like I rarely hear uh, in the director-actor relationship, the director actually talk about the actor as artist having sort of changed or gone through transitions before coming on to the next film, even though they maybe have done more films. What kind of sort of transition or what kind of sort of different artistic approach would you say Stalin or maybe another actor that you've worked with a couple times has, has done before? I don't want him to throw you under the bus or anything. If it no, no, no. I, I, uh, a lot of the actors that are in this film I worked with before, two or three times, actually. Uh, I think uh, in, in Stellan's case, the fact that he keeps growing, that he's, uh, you know, he, he was courageous the first time we worked together. I think he's even more courageous now. Uh, uh, wanting to do things... Uh, without a safety net, um, trying to look at things uh, in a different way and not being prejudiced or being uh, hampered by his own comfort, you know. So, I mean, he's right, he's a city boy. He does not like the wilderness, but once he's there, he just goes with it, you know. Uh, and that is incredibly liberating for a director to have people with you who just say, well, we're here, let's try to make the most of it and explore it without having a set, you know, predis you know predetermined uh, thing that you want to achieve, you know. Um, so the process is really important. Absolutely. I'm going to open up to the audience for questions. Who has questions? Hello. Um, I saw this film when they showed it at Tribeca, and one of my favorite things about it was the flashing of the dead characters. And I was wondering what was the thought process behind that, and for Stellan, was that like a quirk in the script that made you hesitant? Uh, I could start by saying it wasn't in the script, so and that was not what made made me hes hesitate. Uh, it was that I, I I just I couldn't smell the form. I couldn't smell what kind of movie it was we were doing, which is of of course a good thing since I want to do films that hasn't been made before. Uh, but uh, as Peter can tell you about the process and how how he came up with the idea of the death certificates. <laughs> <laughs> I. Uh, I wanted the first time that he hits, the first guy he hits, I wanted the audience to, at least inside, cheer like they do in good revenge movies, like, yeah, hit that guy. And then, as he keeps punching the guy, that they would all of a sudden get uncomfortable because it's more violent and more brutal than what they had bargained for. Uh, and, you know, the people die in action films, or uh, that's nothing new. So I had wanted people to, by the time they die, no matter how bad and how stupid or how gangster brutal they are, to be reduced to a human being. And uh, so I thought at, while we were editing, I was trying to figure out how to somehow just you know, send them off with at least a um, little bit of dignity you know, as human, <laughs> human beings. And we came up with this idea of these uh, sort of death certificates or, you know, death notices, you know, like uh, when you have in the newspaper when people die, kind of. And I, uh, I tried it out on uh, some friends and uh, watching the a screening. And, and, and I got more uh, playful with it and we started playing with, uh, you know, what kind of uh, religious denomination people had and... Uh, you know, elaborating on it, and it just evolved, and it, it became confident that it was going to be part of the film, and eventually just stayed in. You know, it's. Uh, it also complements very well the the fact that all of the sort of gangsters are, for the most part, have 
idiosyncratic quirks that go along with them that most gangsters in movies don't. Like you said, it's not just the death certificates that boil them down to a human being. It's also the fact that they are kind of at least somewhat dimensional characters throughout the story. Yeah, and uh, yeah, like I said, they're not functions. They are actual people who stray into the mo this movie and into the path of this violent man. <laughs> the violent plowman. Uh, one more question. Uh, welcome, Sal and Hans. Um, I have a question to both of you. So if you were not an actor and director, what would you want to do and what would you want to be? Uh, I, I've, since I was a child, I've been hunting, and uh, I'm quite good at slaughtering, you know, field dressing, I guess it's called in English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I always thought that I would become, I would be a good surgeon. And I mentioned this to a doctor once, that I thought if I wasn't a filmmaker, I would have liked to have become a surgeon, and, and that my knowledge of anatomy from, from field dressing animals was useful, and he said, well, we tend to try to keep the patients alive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's, I would have liked to be a surgeon. I got a steady hand. That's I, true, that was really steady. I don't know if you could see it. I don't know, uh, I, my ambition, I, I still haven't decided what to do when I grow up, and I always wanted to be a diplomat because I thought that diplomats traveled the world and created peace. But uh, I have realized that that might not be true. Uh, at least if you look at the world, we don't, in, in that case, we don't have enough diplomats. But uh, when I grow up, I don't know what I'm going to do. But uh, as, uh, as for now, I, I really enjoy this, and I'll stick to it for a while. Guys, uh, oh, sorry, did you? Actually, he has a standing offer to become a snowplow operator from the guy who owns the truck. Is that true? Was he impressed with your skills? Absolutely, he was. Uh, I, I was good. <laughs> Guys, how can people see uh, the film? When can people see the movie? What? It opens uh, August 26th uh, in uh, theaters, uh, maybe not in every city of uh, the U.S., but uh, a few places. And it's also online uh, on iTunes and uh, various platforms um, in order of disappearance. I hope people watch it. I think they should watch it. Please, go check out the film. It's really fantastic. Guys, thank you so much. Thank for you very much. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you.